Imagine walking down to your local convenience store on an average day. You want to buy your favorite ice cold can of Coca Cola, but you notice that it costs 20% more. Do you still buy it? Maybe you do, or maybe you don't. You later find out that these taxes were imposed by the government to reduce the consumption of sugary drinks. How would you feel about that? Let's unpack the idea behind health taxes. Let's do it. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. Happy New Year. My name is LaShawn, and I'm here with some of the finest public health professionals Gordon, Linda, Sully, Ben, and Will. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. Health taxes are imposed on products that have negative public health impact, such as tobacco, alcohol, or sugar sweetened beverages. It also includes fossil fuels. Um, and I think that's very interesting. So, what do you guys think?、Uh, why does it make sense to put fossil fuels under health taxes? That's a very interesting question. And I think that, you know, it's for us as public health professionals, we see the connection between fossil fuel and how it can impact individual or population health. But for many out there,、um, when they think of health and、um, products that have negative health impacts, Fossil fuels might not be the first thing that comes to mind. And I think, you know, like we know, for example, foss- burning fossil fuels,、um, especially whether it's in cars or vehicles or、uh, manufacturing,、um, things like that, has, you know, directly impacts、um, carbon emissions and has an impact on the climate and the environment. And, you know, that in turn comes with many related health impacts, such as, you know, Acid rain, warming of you know, temperatures, melting of ice caps, all these things that can have a detrimental、um, effect on, the, the hu- on humans and just populations in general. So, I mean, I guess for us it makes sense, but I can see why、um, you know, people might <laughs>、um, question that, that classification.、Yeah. It's like t- two degrees of separation, right? It's so far removed from having a direct、mm-hmm. human health impact. But if you think of Expanding on your example, you have air pollution that can lead to things like、um, high rates of asthma in certain、um, cities or、uh, jurisdictions with a lot of air pollution. So,、um, there is, it's probably two or three degrees of separation, but there is a health impact for um, um, pollution and burning fossil fuels for sure. Health taxes, they originally,、um, I guess, historically, when we're speaking,、um, it was more so used as a Kind of a, fist, a way to generate revenue、uh, for governments. But、um, as more and more research has been done,、um, the social, economic, and health harms associated、um, with use of certain products、um, have been known. And、um, there's been an increasing push to learn more about the policy and different health、um, outcomes of implementing such taxes and the benefits that they can bring to our populations.、Um, so, do you guys know of any countries that? Have actually implemented health taxes. And、um, if you want to share maybe any personal experiences you may have or have seen、um, these, these health taxes in the real world setting. Definitely in Canada, you know, we have a carbon tax, which、um, is really controversial, I guess. People, I think, are either for it or against it. Hardly are people just kind of in the middle. So there's an example.、Mm-hmm. So、um, for a work, I work on、um, a file related to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and which is like the,、uh, one of the treaties under the, you know, the WHO, you know, looking at、um, you know, how can we reduce and ultimately eliminate the consumption、uh, um, and use of tobacco、um, recreationally or, and whatnot. And、um, for, so it's kind of signed by a number of countries、um, around the world. And I remember in one of our, we had a kind of a webinar series, and there was an individual from the Nigerian Ministry of Health, or I think it was Nigeria.、Um, yeah, it was one of the sub Saharan African countries talking about how、um, their country has implemented、um, tobacco, like tobacco tax, and have, been, have used the revenue from that to. Pump back into national tobacco control programs and smoking cessation like advocacy and campaigns, which I think kind of falls right in line with what we're talking about here with health taxes. Absolutely. And、um, I did more research into it and I found out there's a bunch of countries, including Canada and、uh, Nigeria, as you mentioned,、uh, 
um, such as Botswana, Egypt, Panama, the Philippines, Thailand. And uh, Thailand, as you all know, is an example I love to talk about because I, I got the chance to spend a lot of time there. And、um, like Will mentioned, a lot of these health taxes that are collected can actually go into a specific kind of pool of funding, whether it be for more public health related activities, health promotion. So, what's interesting in Thailand is、um, the taxes that they collect from、um, items that are purchased, such as、um, alcohol or cigarettes. They go directly to fund their public health institution、uh, called Thai Health. And with that, with that,、uh, with Thai Health, they use that money directly into health promotion campaigns to reduce or promote、um, educational material on the reduction of harmful alcohol use,、um, the reduction of you know, sugar sweetened beverages, and also stuff like、um, helmet use and promote helmet use and road safety. So, that's just another mechanism these health taxes could possibly be used for. So, in addition to getting revenue to promote other kinds of healthy behavior that may or not be related to the thing being taxed,、um, the goal is also to re- reduce consumption of the thing being taxed, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, these taxes they raise the cost of like manufacturing, distributing, retailing, or consuming、mm-hmm. any of these products. And then, my Um, question is, I, was, I wonder how the industries in these companies respond to these health taxes. That was one of my things I was wondering too, because it seems like, for example, the tobacco industry,、um, when there is a health tax imposed on their products, it's,、um, they、uh, tend to raise the prices to offset that tax, and then the、mm. customer ends up footing the bill. But it seems like, from looking at this topic, that that's not necessarily a bad thing. The idea is if something is too Costly for someone to afford, they're less likely to purchase and consume it. So, I guess it only works when、um, it's a consumer that has to pay the tax, but it's still unfair that the, the big、um, you know, tobacco and all those industries、um, i t s not hurting their pocket as much because they can respond with rising the prices. So,、mm. I think raising up prices. It would probably be the better choice,、um, ethically speaking, because I know of many instances where, when these taxes are imposed on these in- industries such as tobacco,、um, these companies, instead of raising prices for their products, they instead look to how, I guess, look to see how they can、um, reduce costs in the supply chain. And this, what this means is they look at you know, other sources of, of labor, for example, oftentimes you know, bringing in、uh, children, bringing in、um, marginalized or vulnerable people, and exploiting those individuals so that,、um, you know, f- I guess, from one end, f- for the consumers, it seems like, oh, you know, these, guys,、uh, or sorry, these, these companies are still、um, you know, very much for the consumer and keeping、mm-hmm. our interests、um, in their mind. But in reality, Sure, they are keeping the prices the same, but you know, how are you offsetting that? They are exploiting these other individuals, which it's, yeah, it's a really disgusting move and it is quite sad. Yeah, just to add on to that, well, another thing that these industries do is that because health taxes are defined on these products, for example,、um, sweetened beverages, tobacco, etc., and there's a certain definition which all these products fall, fall under. These companies will use alternatives as to get past the health taxes. So, for example,、um, in the food industry, there is the、um, health tax on sugar. So now they have meetings where they f- literally figure out how do we call sugar not sugar? They'll have all these different names on the labels just to get past the health taxes. Or with even to the, pack, the tobacco industry, we have vaping as an alternative. And then as evidence rises onto that, they're still able to get. Past that for now. Yeah. And I think all the points you all raise、um, are very important. And it just goes to show how complex this issue is and how、um, there's different levels that we have to consider to make sure that if、um, a country does decide to implement these taxes, there's different considerations such as the industry、um, at the individual level, who do they have to consider, and all these factors, which we're about to get into. So, Um, just before we get into the public health significance, I just want to、um, let everyone know that the WHO has endorsed the implementation of health taxes on sugar sweetened beverages, alcohol, and tobacco. And、um, they, they also mentioned that these health taxes can be used as a tool to attain a lot of the sustainable development goals that have been outlined,、um, such as goal three,、um, goal one, goal five, goal 10, and goal eight.、Um, so I guess with that, Let's talk about the public health significance. And at the forefront of that significance, 
um, I would argue are non-communicable diseases, NCDs. And so when we're talking about non-communicable diseases, we know that the leading cause of death in the world, killing more than 41 million people, and that's over around 70% of all deaths. And so we talked about this in several other episodes, you know, at the global level, seven out of the 10 leading causes of deaths were indeed non-communicable diseases. And how this relates to what we're talking about in terms of health taxes is that um, alcohol, tobacco, and sugar-sweetened beverages are a main contributor to a lot of these non-communicable diseases. So I'd like to uh, raise the question, why are these uh, three products so impactful? What components or characteristics of these products make them so well consumed? I mean, definitely in the case of sugar, for example, it's addictive, right? Like you... And, and there, it's designed that way and companies know that. So if you have one sugary thing, you're more likely to have another one. And so um, I think that um, it's impactful because you're, the consumption is going to be more. I'm going to put on my anthropologist hat for a minute here and say that um, I think all three of these products um, traditionally or you know, contemporarily is associated with wealth. Um, you know, if you look at things like sugar, um, you know, sugar was once... Um, a food that was only consumed by the wealthy at one point and eventually um, kind of permeated the society to become more of, a, of a, a product that everyone can have access to. And I would say same with alcohol and tobacco. You know, these are things that um, you have to kind of at least be of a certain or companies like to market themselves as, um, you know, as um, consumers being of a certain status or class to be to be consuming them so i think um you know companies know this and they really seem to hone in on these kind of characteristics and really um yes yeah just play up the mark yes use up their marketing dollars or whatever to to really um push this messaging across. I think currently the idea of a health tax, while it does, it is endorsed by WHO and it does have long-term health benefits, I think that these items are not always associated with wealth, in fact, associated with maybe lower income earners. And so the burden of the health tax falls more on low income earners. Right. And another thing too, that um, historically, like Will said, you know, there's a wealth component and I feel like modern day it's associated with more um i don't know how else to say it but being cool so vaping looks cool smoking a cigarette looks cool taking a picture on instagram holding coca-cola is is a cool thing to do um you're drinking gray goose uh, that's a fancy bottle of vodka you look cool so it's all it plays up kind of um even though um like you said linda nowadays um lower income people are disproportionately affected uh, or disproportionately likely to use those products and then therefore disproportionately affected by a health tax um the marketing like will says they figure out a way how to get to all the audience so you know before it was there's value in getting it to people of status now it's just it benefits us when everybody uses it and you know if we look at age demographics we're worried about our youth right um there's a there's an age limit for when you can buy a cigarette for when you can buy alcohol in, in a lot of countries and then you have the elephant in the room, sugar sweetened beverages, where there's really no limit for when someone or a kid can consume that. So um, we talk about a lot about the the taxes or banning marketing to, to, to kids for that very reason, because it's you, I'm not sure if you're able to pass a ban where you can you can't drink a Coca-Cola till you turn 18. Um, so there's different mm. ways to att attack different things, like you said. Yeah. Adding on to that, and this may be me just coming out of the holiday season, but like how many times did you see alcohol or chocolates being sent as gifts? Like we've normalized it in our society so well. And like mm -hmm. you said, Gordon, it's the way of just being cool, giving these gifts and whatnot. And then the other comment that you made, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, is that why stop at sugar sweetened beverages for kids? Look at cereal. Cereal is packed with sugar. You're why coming after okay? my cereal, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming after cereal next. <laughs> it's not Kellogg's. Don't it's like that. Uh, the mm. honey oats, that mm. healthy one that they market. Right. Right. Yeah. Is that or the yeah, count? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think um, it's like there's a deadly combination here with when we talk about first addiction and um, like the ease of access. 
I would say,、mm-hmm. or like the marketing and all that,、mm-hmm. and just the promotion aspect of it. This, I mean, of course, along with other factors, but these two are like the main source of like why it is problematic、mm-hmm. the way we see it nowadays, and like how、uh, it leads to N- NCDs, and and that's why、um, people are talking about taxing that stuff. It's like so, like there's a historical context. To it、mm-hmm. that led us to where we are、yeah. now, and now we're like backpedaling to see, okay, what are we supposed to do now?、Right. Oh, all right, there's ease of access, put more restrictions. The, the addiction is going to stay there, so like we have to deal with that. Yeah, I, I wanted to add this too. If, when you think about it, we talk about in in societies,、um, freedom of choice is very important, right? So, but. When you look at certain products with addiction, addictive properties, there's less of that element of freedom of choice because once you become addicted to it, it becomes biological in the way that you need and depend on those products. So it's not like you can say、um, you're taking away free liberty from everyone. Let everyone smoke if they want to. Let everyone drink as many Coca Colas as they want to.、I'll、let everyone you know smoke as much as they want to because at a certain point. There are a lot of people that don't want to be doing doing that anymore and don't know how to to stop or don't have the support to stop. So it's it's beyond,、um, you know, the argument of things like free choice, in my opinion. And even Sully, you were mentioning, you know, ease of access, and I think that's when we can't talk about NCDs without talking about are healthier alternatives available? Because if the cheapest or the more accessible option is the sugary option, is you know. Tobacco or alcohol or something that has a negative health impact. How do you expect someone to choose a healthier alternative?、Mm. And then you're going to go and tax that. Then I personally, I've had a lot of feelings researching this, and I used to be all for health taxes, but just the equity aspect. I'm concluding that a health tax alone is a half measure. So if there aren't going to be, you know, other alternatives that increase access to healthier alternatives, then It has unintended negative impacts. Absolutely, for sure, and I think that's definitely、um, a consideration public health professionals always have. Right? It's the fact that sure, you always want to make the the healthier choice, the more accessible choice, the more affordable choice. But is that actually being done?、Um, how do we know that if we implement these taxes? How do we know that they're not disproportionately affecting communities that may be relying on?、Um, Um, some of these、um, items. So,、uh, with that, it's important to have a multi-prong approach and make sure that there's subsidization or、um, sort of funding to encourage、um, that healthy alternative choice. Absolutely. Right, and I think that's where we as public health can come in. Exactly.、Yeah. So, so I, I'd like to also talk about,、um, I guess, more high-level stuff as well. So,、um, we know that、um, tobacco, alcohol,、um, and sugar. Sugary beverage consumption accounts for such a large、uh, proportion of the world's burden of premature death and disease, and especially this is true in low and middle income countries,、um, where the the products increase the risks of NCDs, like we mentioned, and that would result in、uh, premature death, productivity losses,、um, uh, healthcare costs, and、um, other negative consequences. Um, and there's a lot of jarring stats out there that show、um, how disproportionately、um, low and middle-income countries are affected by NCDs as a result of、uh, tobacco, alcohol, and sugary beverages.、Um, but why do you all think that、um, this is the case? Why do you think low and middle-income countries、um, have this、um, growing and larger burden of non-communicable diseases? I think, for me. This relates to I don't know if y'all remember our、um, the one lecture we had here in MPH where, where with the、um, yeah Jason where he's a gra- graduate student、uh, at Western University kind of looking at、um, you know obesity trends and you know healthy diets in sub-Saharan Africa、um, so I guess taking that experience as well as like personal experience you know、um, visiting family in China and kind of seeing the the overall health trend、um, in that country. It's. I. I would say it's. It definitely. I would. You no. Know, personally, say it still relates to the idea of just shifting、um, norms and shifting idea、uh, and kind of images, right?、Um, you know, things like Coca Cola. When I was a child,、um, I remember in China it was you know something that was very expensive and you know you had to be a certain 
level a certain class to afford it and you know with globalization and you know the growing economy it's become more of a um a readily available commodity however you know despite the good action i guess them the product price dropping um the idea in many people's minds still remains coca-cola is associated with the west um you know with um euro american kind of ideas therefore it is um it, it, it people have to pay a premium so i think um you know things like like sugar sweetened beverages um you know i would even cut, kind of classify alcohol or tobacco into this but just these i these these goods um especially in you know, lower middle income countries that are try, um develop developing and trying to kind of um, align with the global markets many people see these as kind of um, an avenue to Yes, get um to being on par with let's say a euro a euro counterpart so i think um with that in mind then um it, it would make sense that there is a higher proportion of um, ncds because like if it's let's say if more people are just simply um, using these products and you know drinking sugar sweetened beverages simply because they want to um you know seem more global seem more um you know westernized then it's it's almost like a double burden of both um, from the actual product, but also um, just sheer amount and consumption. Yeah, I wanted to give the other side of the coin with that because I, I agree with that. And at first, I was very much of that perspective as well. But I think another aspect of that is that sometimes low and middle income countries don't have the infrastructure to provide those healthy options. Like, for example, this is alluding back to what Linda said earlier, is that in some countries, Coke is cheaper than water. You know, how did that come to be? And if you are a family in that situation and, you know, it's easier for your family just to drink Coke than it is water, then that's a failure of the government's infrastructure of their healthcare system or their supply chains. So it, I agree with what you said, but it could also be the opposite as well. That's crazy to think that, you know, Coke. Um, and and, I, and I'm, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, I never really thought of it that way. That, um, you know, especially for us living um, as privileged people in Canada. The water is, seems to be such a um, readily available commodity. And even, you know, we see this in our country as well, where you have communities, indigenous communities, where water access is is a concern mm. and it's, you know, they're not getting it. And then to, I guess just it never even occurred to me that in some countries, it's, it's, it's either you drink this beverage to stay alive or you don't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um you know case in point like you said indigenous rural and remote indigenous communities where they you know they don't have access to a lot of um, fresh produce um what's easier to get at a lower price is the processed foods processed foods tend to have a lot of salt and sugar and then they're inclined the problem but i wanted to come back to that um uh the core of the question there and then we'll touch on it a little bit so historically um civilization you know, has been ravaged more with the um, communicable diseases, so the infectious diseases. Um, we know that life expectancy was very low and didn't start to really pick up till fairly recently. But now that we have a lot of things like vaccines, so thank you vaccines, a lot of medical treatment for infectious diseases, uh, people are living longer. So, um, and then you have that shift, like you mentioned, with in, in industrialization, globalization, um, we're processing more unhealthy foods, uh, that have a longer shelf life because you know it's one thing to say yes let's give everyone healthy food but there's a lot of food waste also and that costs a lot of, of money to our society so um there's a lot of processed foods that are available whether it's you want to call put fast foods and stuff in that category and that's just tends to be cheaper in a lot of situations and and more accessible so as people start to transition more over from that quote-unquote natural diet that we've been used to in, in history to something more processed then we have all these comorbidities and non-communicable diseases that we're seeing now. And it's called the epidemiological transition or something like that, by the way. Yeah, no, you, you all raise amazing points about how industry plays a role, how social norms play a role, how affordability plays a role, how um, infrastructure of healthcare plays a role, and the historical kind of underpinning of all this. And um, we can talk all day about, you know, specific stats and um, about tobacco, alcohol, processed foods with added sugar. And we know millions of people are affected by this worldwide. 
And so um, a lot of people wonder, and I think in public health, it's always important to um, consider all lives. Um, and, you know, you, it's hard to, it's, it's also important to, um, if you're talking to a specific audience, for example, policymakers or economists, they want to know um, some of the hard, hardcore concrete um, statistics and economic value of, you know, uh, what kind of burden tobacco, alcohol and processed foods um, has. So I guess in terms of um, sheer numbers and the economic cost of these three items, uh, what have you guys, um, what have you all um, read about? So as I mentioned before, um, this this kind of notion of freedom of choice does have consequences to the broader society. Um, if we leave things unchecked like um, tobacco consumption, there is an inherent cost to the whole of society, right? Because um, in, in societies or, or, or countries like Canada where there's something like a universal healthcare system, um, if, if smoking rates and lung cancer rates go unchecked, um, everyone kind of bears that expense. So in a situation when we talk about, you know, tobacco, um, you know, alcohol consumption and consumption of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, we know that the economic costs of smoking in particular was estimated at somewhere around 1.4 trillion with a T uh, dollars globally. And I believe that's US dollars. And we can see, uh, just thinking of we, in public health, we talk about finite resources all the time. Wouldn't it be sweet if we could get some of that money to put into um, vulnerable communities, vulnerable populations, and um, you know address some of those needs there instead of just fight, you know, plugging holes um, that are caused by some of these harmful substances? I guess in general, when we're talking tobacco, alcohol, and sugary drinks, um, like Gordon mentioned, there are a lot of economic costs and productivity concerns um, that are associated with it. And um, as also what Lynch, Linda mentioned, health taxes shouldn't be the only solution, but um, rather part of the solution, the total solution. So I guess with that, uh, let's start talking about some of the um, benefits that are stated of health taxes. Um, the WHO states that uh, health taxes are cost-effective measures which result in healthier lives, healthier populations, and wealthier treasuries. So do you guys want to break that down a bit? Can we can we pick oh, sides on very, this one? Very vague. Yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's we could definitely probably be fun. Like some people are opposed and some people are for it and just kind of talk about it for five minutes. All right, I'll go opposed. All right. mm -hmm. I'll oppose it too. A little right. nuance there. All right, over to you, Will. All right. Uh, if that, uh, if you're gonna be for it. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm on the benefit side because it's one of those things where it's there's no, it's not a clear dichotomy, right? It's not mm -hmm. good or bad. Mm -hmm. It's and it's mm -hmm. it, there's issues on both sides. But sure, like I'll, I'll I'll take this. I'll take the the stand and I'll join the benefits camp for now. Um, I would say you know as we mentioned earlier, um, one of the main benefits of health taxes is that you're taxing a negatively impacting product so that you can use the, the, the profit to, you, you take the profit and you pump it back into um, supporting programs or policies around that product. So, you know, the first example, obviously that comes to mind for me is tobacco, right? You, you, you have tobacco taxes, you take these tobacco taxes and you pump it back into tobacco cessation or, um, you know, support programs. And I think, you know, is that a great option? I think so, because um, especially if you have, you know, like like mentioned, with public health being so fine, so resource um, dependent and you know, oftentimes not having enough resource, if you kind of ha having this self-sufficient cycle that's sustainable and you're able to kind of um, able to sp support itself, then um, the likelihood of that kind of system being shut down and canceled, if, if you will, um, I would say the likelihood is low. And the potential um, societal and populational health impacts are high. Yeah, and what I would also say about um, I mean, the benefits, I mean, people, when, when, they, when they see um, health taxes in general, they ask about whether it leads to the objective of reducing consumption of, say, tobacco. And, well... To make that connection, you need evidence. Now, we have historical evidence on how tobacco was 
we were able to reduce it through taxation and other means, but mainly taxation um, until like this day and age where like you can barely see anyone smoking cigarettes and like it's not considered cool anymore. I mean, now vaping is cool, but then that's its own problem. I would argue against that still. Like, <laughs> Go ahead. You're against. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just against that point. <laughs> okay, is, okay. Is that uh, when you look when you look at the, the media, like... Yes, I, I will admit it's not as marketed as heavily as back in the day where you had cigarettes in literally everyone's mouths as they were on their like leather jackets and their cool bikes. Like we're, we're beyond that point. But I still mm. think um, like the the effect, the smoking a cigarette and knowing that it's, you know, look frowned upon on or there's a higher tax, it still looked cool because you're kind of like revolutionary against the system. You know, it's a rebellion kind of deal. So I don't think socially we're ever going to win in that case. Like, I, I agree, maybe it's the taxation part that we need to focus on, but at the same time, as I'm sure you guys will raise, is that there are issues with the taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are issues with if the taxes. If I can just add one more point. So, related to the benefits of health taxes, I think that, um, you know, I wouldn't say this is the only benefit, but at least it's what the first thing that comes to my mind is, in order for a health tax to be beneficial, it you it must be, um, I guess, the profits up from it must go back into supporting the community or the programs. If you're simply just collecting tax money for the sake of collecting money and not actually giving it back to health promotion, education, or um, you know support, then then in that case, I think it's absolutely, you know, it's it's a joke, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's it's in fact it can probably hurt more people than it actually helps. Mm -hmm. But if we are operating under the assumption that all benefit all health taxes and all profits made from these sources are going back to benefiting the um you know whatever negative product they're trying to counter then i think by all means it's it's a very useful um intervention we've we've talked a lot about tobacco but let me just add a little benefit for the alcohol uh, taxation so it's been shown that um with higher alcohol prices and taxes it leads to reduction of motor vehicle crashes and fatalities and a whole bunch of other um, negative consequences um, so i guess in terms of alcohol that would be considered another um, kind of a side benefit of doing this because as we know there's a lot of um, negative things that could come from alcohol abuse whether it's of several incidences of violence so if that can be reduced as a potential side effect of raising taxes i think that's something that definitely has to be looked into um, and in terms of sugary sweetened beverages um, there is evidence out there that shows that you know sugary beverage prices um, um, is correlated and have been shown to be associated with lower body weight and there's been many simulation studies that have shown that um, there have been reductions in sugary drink consumption as a result of um, increasing these taxes and there's a subsequent decrease in um, these diseases such as diabetes so that's mm. all great and everything um, <laughs> but, Just jumping in. but if so. you know some opposition to the health taxes so not me so don't come after me um, might include you know if the tax burden becomes so high um, the you know you might price out to big tobacco big alcohol and, and sugar sweetened beverage manufacturers out of the industry, they might not be able to sustain their business model, paying employers, paying employees, uh, people might get laid off and it might affect the job market. Um, that's one common argument that is used. Um, even just taxes in general, when you think of taxes on businesses, um, that's a common argument used when you raise taxes. Um, it's just not, the return on investment is not sufficient for a lot of these industries and businesses to carry on. That's one common argument that is used. And however, this that and, and has been debunked to a certain extent. Um, but there's one real um, opposition too, and Linda mentioned it earlier, and I'll turn this over to her with the, the impact on, on the poor. So like Will said, um, it's not health taxes or bust necessarily, it's health taxes and the money must necessarily go to those who the very thing you're trying to prevent is affecting. And then if in situations where that doesn't happen, um, and you have, you know, certain communities uh, that are vulnerable, whether it's um, lower access to healthy foods, living in food deserts or food swamps, where the price of fast foods gets higher, but there's not a proportional increase to the access of healthy foods. Um, you might see just, you know, 
you you lower the consumption of fast food but then these families are just not just eating less period so uh that that needs to be addressed as well and to be clear i i don't i'm not against <laughs> health taxes to be clear <laughs> i think it's a, a great public health yeah. initiative but it even from the perspective of using a health tax to decrease um unhealthy behaviors i think if we don't ask what's causing that behavior in the first place then yes there are we may risk um causing more unintended negative impacts as opposed to the positive impact we had hoped for and so causes of the causes no and you know what too like to expand on that further okay a lot of another criticism too of a health tax is that it it kind of um facilitates i think they call it a paternal state right where the, the state just controls everything and they they have a stake and but there are other unhealthy behaviors such as you know maybe staying on your phone too much um not you know getting in like how are other things i'm um, going to fit in that what are they are there going to be taxes for someone who stays on their phone too long has eye disease or um social deficits like what what is the end of of the road for ta- imposing a tax on unhealthy consumption of products or unhealthy behaviors that's another um issue yeah that brings me to the question cuz like we're taxing these things in order to reduce consumption ultimately so behavior right, right. Be- yeah changing mm-hmm. behavior yeah um how do we know that these taxes are what's directly reducing that behavior or is it the funding that comes from these taxes that go through p- to public health measures that ultimately address that problem and reduce the behavior that's a good question however i don't think that's necessarily important because we know just like will said the two have to go together as a package deal so to tease out exactly what's doing it is not necessarily beneficial uh it's almost mm-hmm. like a package deal so i think it's just one of those where in public health too because it's hard to you wouldn't necessarily do a randomized control trial for this because it's not you know when there's no evidence you and it and it is ethical you can look into doing something randomized control but when there's evidence from um other countries um that these two tend to work together i don't think it's useful to find out which one exactly is is doing it but that's my opinion i'd like to just quickly like a small tangent um i i, I like what you, the point you said earlier gordon about um you know bringing in things like cell phones right and like you know asking question should cell phones like be included in as part of a health tax because if we bring if we bring this back to the initial question of how does fossil fuels fit into this well you know fossil fuels ultimately you know there is that health kind of connection right and if we, and for us public health professionals and you know any other policy makers or um health um researchers or professionals who are interested in this topic you know <laughs> we we draw these connections and we kind of see these th- things existing as a system and you know looking at it that way there's so many things that would f- technically fall under a health tax plastic But bottles it's more the question of <laughs> yeah, bottled water like, do you want to like ad- address these things yeah so <laughs> that's i i just found that very interesting mm. <laughs> I think that was a great discussion about the public health significance and talking about non-communicable diseases and the impact that arises from these three products that we mentioned. We also talked about and kind of um, artificially uh, chose some sides of, you know, uh, for or against health taxes, and we kind of talked about some of the different considerations that had to be made when considering health taxes. Um, and there's been um, many countries that have specific concrete examples about um, how they've implemented health taxes, whether it's in Brazil, whether it's in Russia, or whether it's in Mexico. And they've had um, brilliant results published that we can link in the description of our episode. Something we didn't mention though is how health taxes can lead corporations to make healthier alternatives mm. because otherwise they would lose revenue if they don't have a healthier alternative, like like things like vitamin water. um healthier. Mm-hmm. So I think like that pressure to make companies, you know, bend to more healthier alternatives is a positive. Um and I know I've spent the whole hour bashing on health taxes, <laughs> but there are positives. Like everyone's been saying there is evidence that these 
um, health taxes have worked in the context of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, alcohol and tobacco to reduce um, consumption. Um, what is less known is kind of the long term follow to that. Um, how in terms of the I guess you call it arms race, how these industries find workarounds and are those workarounds um, more harmful than the initial thing we were trying to prevent? A lot less is known about kind of how what are the long term consequences of a sustained health tax because we know in a lot of this is very political as well right so a lot of jurisdictions like we talk about that have seen success in these industries we know that these industries are also a part of the political process as well with funding and stuff so in a lot of cases some of these taxes often get repealed and we're not able to see you know long term how these you know whether it's positive or negative what these impacts look like so um, while we do have a lot of good data um, and maybe the short and medium term uh, we don't know a lot about the 10 and the 20 and the 25 years how these things impact if they're implemented for that period of time so more to come on that hopefully health taxes on tobacco alcohol and sugar sweetened beverages present another tool among many in our arsenal as public health professionals to improve population health outcomes we have explored the public health significance of health taxes its benefits its opposition and highlighted some countries that have seen success through the implementation of health taxes given what you've just heard about health taxes does this change your opinion on them one thing is for sure, we have to ensure the healthy choice is the easier choice and do so in a meaningful way. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our content and would like to stay up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. To learn more about our community initiatives and how you can support us, visit our website at thepublichealthinsight.com. Join the PHI community and let's make public health viral.